today we're looking at virtual networking. So again, a lot of this is very similar. Okay, very similar to your VMware workstation, very similar to your VCA that we spoke about. So, <coughs> so today we're going to look at creating and using uh, Hyper-V virtual switches, advanced Hyper-V networking features, and configuring and using the uh, virtual networking in Hyper-V. So first of all, uh, we're going to look look at the virtual switches. Uh, okay, so if you remember uh, what we called uh, in, in V, you notice that these things pop up. Like I said, vSphere is the leader, VMware is the leader in virtualization. Microsoft has always been trying to catch up. So even in their own PowerPoint, this is Microsoft PowerPoint, by the way, it's all it's still comparing to VMware. So this compares to VMware V switches, the standard switches, if you remember, not the distributor switches. All right, so so virtual switches, self, it's a software implemented layer two switch. It connects virtual machines to the virtual and physical networks, okay? Uh, the, the pair, the, yeah, so the parent partition, so that's an interesting thing. So remember what I said, remember in CERT 4, you learned about two types of virtualization. One was hosted virtualization, what was the other type? Remember VMware Workstation is a hosted virtualization because it sits on top of hardware in an operating system like Windows 10, then VMware Workstation, then you have your virtual machines. So that sits on top of a host operating system, doesn't it? And that's why it's called hosted virtualization or a layer, uh, what's, a, uh, what's the type two hypervisor? What was the other type? Embedded. Not embedded, but you're on the right track, probably different words. These these teachers know. These teachers know it was in CERT four. Uh, it's called bare metal. Bare metal virtualization or type one hypervisor. So bare metal is where the uh, the hypervisor is the operating system. Like our ESXi, we didn't have to install Windows Server and install ESXi, did we? We just installed ESXi onto the hardware and then we could virtualize straight after that, couldn't we? So that's why layer. What's a bare metal? It's using your literally installing it on the physical devices. What about Hyper-V? Oh, Hyper-V is interesting, isn't it? Hyper-V, what did we do? How did we install it? We got the server, Microsoft server. Then we added the Hyper-V role, didn't we? Whoa, is that bare metal then? because we've got the operating system, Microsoft server, then we installed the Hyper-V role, didn't we? That's what it looks like. But it is bare metal, I'll show you why. Let's get out of here for a second and let me share a whiteboard instead because uh, I need to draw a diagram. So share a whiteboard, that's the one. And luckily enough, Hopefully this works. All right, I have to choose, uh, it's stupid. We've got this lovely feature, but we have to choose, all right, all right. Yeah, okay. So, all right, so let's, all right, let's, uh, let's have a look at it. So basically, uh, ESXi, sorry guys, I'm not an expert using uh, drawing. I'm no expert using this, so bear with me. So we have hardware, okay? And like I said, ESXi, we installed EXXI, and then we have the VMs. <sighs> Sorry, guys, <laughs> it's not the best drawing. I know, but basically, it's bare metal. Okay. With Hyper uh, Hyper V, we have the hardware still, and then we already had our Microsoft 
server, right? And then we installed Hyper-V, didn't we? The Hyper-V role. And, and I'm saying, I'm telling you, that's still, that's still, let me just, uh, let me see if I can change color. Oh, I am no, not good at this at all. Right, so, so I'm saying that it's still type one hosted virtualization. So what actually happens when you install the Hyper-V role is you actually not adding on top of here. Okay, you're not installing it on top of server. What actually happens is that you're actually putting Hyper-V Hyper-V underneath it, if you like. And you're making this Microsoft server, the operating system, all that stuff, you're making that a VM. Okay, you know the inter interface we're using? We log in, we do everything. That's actually a virtual machine. Okay, so that's uh, probably blowing your minds right now. Right? That's actually what's happened is they've installed Hyper-V underneath it. They've turned the core parts of the uh, Microsoft server, added a Hyper-V role, put it underneath it, and then converted the graphical part, the, the thing you're inter inter uh, interfacing with, into a uh, virtual machine. So let's go back to our let's go back to our screen sharing. So what's happened is that becomes a virtual machine, and that's what they're referring to as this parent partition. Okay. So in, in VMware, the ESXi, there was none, none of that. It's pretty easy. We install it. We use a web interface, we interact with the, uh, with the ESXi. But with the Hyper-V, we actually turn that original operating system into a parent partition, which is also a virtual machine. And when you create a Hyper-V server, you already you immediately get some virtual networking. Okay? Uh, so extensible, uh, so basically uh, the virtual switch from Hyper-V is extensible. Extensible means you can extend it has advanced features that can be replaced. You can have policy enforcement, isolation, traffic shaping, and protection. Remember that, we did all that in the sphere, right? Same thing, same idea, okay? It's managed by the Hyper-V manager software, so that's the interface, the, uh, the, the graphical user interface, or you can use the PowerShell uh, command lines like get uh, VM switch and get is basically getting information about it. It's a bit like in in Cisco, you've got the show command, right? Show this, show that, get is similar in PowerShell. Yeah, Alexi? A question. Yeah. So we convert the initial uh, Windows Server to the virtual machine, but why do, the, do we need it? Well, uh, because that is the one that manages the Hyper-V, okay? So, so still, after installation, Despite the fact that it's like underneath, yeah, we still need. Uh, we use that to manage the underneath. So and normally we're using it just for this uh, purpose. Yeah, uh, and normally if you have a Hyper-V in a virtualization environment, you would never install a graphical user interface. Yeah. Okay, you will install it as a server core yeah. or a nano server. If you remember back to really back <laughs> back in the day, uh, back in your server loading. So because we are still learning. That's why we install with the full graphical user interface, but normally it's just a server core, okay, or nano, which is a headless. The nano is more like the ESXi. It's a, it's a headless, meaning there's no interface at all. You just do it remotely. Even the server core, it just provides you a way to connect remotely anyway, okay? But the whole point of this parent partition is to manage hyper okay? If you like to think of it, it's a special virtual machine that is the management side of the Hyper-V installation underneath. Okay. Okay, parent partitions. 
So that's this virtual machine here that we're talking about. You can have multiple virtual network interface cards and they can be connected to different virtual switches and they can have different bandwidth limitations. So if you look at this, what happens when you install a Hyper-V on there? You might have seen this already. What happens is that you have this Ethernet adapter. Okay, this is your physical adapter. What happens is that even by default, you create a virtual network by default, right? During the installation of Hyper-V, it's one of those things that you, you want to create a virtual network a wizard type thing, okay? If you do, what happens is that you turn this network, physical network interface card into a virtual switch port. Okay, so that, if you remember, we talked about uplinks in the V sphere. If you turn this one, if we select this one as the uplink, this becomes a switch port to the virtual switch. Okay, Do a, does a switch port on a virtual switch have an IP address? This is a question for you guys. These ports, do they have an IP address? Do you configure each port with an IP address? Why is that? Switch. Switch, yes. Uh, what lay and switch for it here? Two. Two. An IP address is layer two, right? Layer two. Uh, IP addressing in layer three. So each of these ports do not have any configuration as far as TCP IP. Just have MAC addresses. No problems. So you'll see when we actually, when you're doing your lab or your practical, that Ethernet becomes blank. If you go in and look at the IP addresses, nothing. It's all blank because it's a switch port. Okay, that's how we uplink to the rest of the physical network. You also see that this, you see the V, the lower V? Okay, see, that means it's a virtual adapter. A bit like our virtual network cards on our host, uh, host computer from VMware installation. So if you look at our, if we have VMware installation, you should see that if we have a look at all of this, you can see, oh, what? Uh, yeah, here, Ethernet 2 and 3, these are virtual network adapters, okay? But when we're looking at this, I know I'm slowing down quite a bit. When we look at this, this is a virtual net Ethernet adapter. You see how this has become that switch port? This becomes the parent partition's connection to that virtual switch. If you want to visualize it, it's like this is that virtual switch and this is the network interface card that connects to it. And then if this was the physical network, it connects to the it's up link for the physical switch. Get me guys? All right. So this is the tricky thing, okay? It's kind of tricky. Because why do we still have it there? It has no information. Why do we automatically get this? Because it's because it's it's the uplink. It's uh, the physical card becomes a switch port, no IP addressing. But the parent partition, which is a virtual machine, if you want to access this virtual switch, it must have a virtual adapter that's connected to that virtual switch. All right, easy enough? All right, hopefully you remember that because uh, it gets a little bit more complicated in, in, in a minute. So we can use, a, uh, we can use the uh, PowerShell command let's add the uh, VM network adapter Management OES, so remember that management traffic. Name, management, add these ones. Storage, live migration. So we're similar to what we had in our VDC. You know what they use that for. One's for managing the thing, one's for the accessing the shared storage, one for live migration, which is like our B motion. And guess what? Look, we can create more and more, more and more virtual network adapters. Okay, these are old called these things, management storage live migration. So management storage live migration. Okay, the parent, we're talking about that operating system that was the Hyper-V, has a physical network adapters. Each virtual machine and the parent has virtual network adapters as well. 
each virtual network adapter is connected to a virtual switch. The types of virtual switch we can have is external, it's like you're bridged, okay? That's your bridge connected in the physical network. That's what most virtualization uh, servers would create, okay? There's probably not many where it's, uh, most of your virtual networks are uh, external because the whole point of your virtualization environment is to give access to the clients on the physical network, access to your uh, virtual machines which provide a service, okay? It's also probably reason, other reasons include the storage. If you're accessing a storage server, that storage server is a physical server that's away from this physical uh, Hyper-V, isn't it? So it's always external. Uh, and also it could be live migration or uh, migration network. Again, that's on a separate physical server. The internal is similar to your idea of host only, meaning it's purely inside this one hyper bit. Okay, the traffic is not going to go out to the physical world, it's just internal. And why would you have this? You would have this, for example, if you've got a, a front-end web server which has an external interface that lets the clients access it, but behind the scenes it needs to access the database, but no one else needs access to the database, so maybe it also has an internal uh, connection and the database server has an internal connection, so that it's a private traffic between the web server and the database, no one else can access it. Makes it more secure, doesn't it? No one else can try to access the database except for the web server, which is purely internal. No one can look at the traffic, no one can try to access the database. There's also private. Okay, private, that's a strange one. Private is, is a virtual machine connections only, so it doesn't, it's not used for uh, the, the parent. This is where you want to isolate a single virtual machine. Okay, if you want to isolate this single virtual machine, uh, yeah, you can make it a private. Configurations, we can use the virtual switch manager to create virtual switches. Uh, it uses virtual machine settings to connect to the virtual network to a, adapt it to a switch. So for example, if we have physical, uh, virtual, sorry, physical adapters, we have virtual adapters and we have the virtual switch. We have the parent partition, which is that special VM that we talked about. It's got a physical adapter, okay? We have these virtual machines, which have virtual adapters. We can create a, create a uh, private uh, switch. So these are private switch and each virtual machine can access this private switch and this is only for them. No one else, the parent has no connection to it, okay? We can create an internal uh, virtual machine, uh, sorry, virtual switch. And in this case, all the virtual machines can also access it, a bit like that, but the parent can also access it. The parent gets a virtual adapter that's connected to that virtual switch, okay? That's the difference between private and internal. And then we can create, oh, sorry. Then we can use NAT to use network address translation to give it access to the physical network as well. But you know that NAT is an extra layer, isn't it? You cannot access it directly from outside to in, really is for out, inside to out from NAT. Whereas this private, there's no way of going out. External is probably what you'll deal with 99.99% of the time because this is where you have an uplink to the physical network from the virtual network and this is one of the physical adapters on your Hyper-V server. The parent also gets a virtual network adapter and connects to the virtual switch. You notice that this has no IP, that's what I was saying before. It converts this physical adapter into a switch port effectively. Switch ports don't have IP addresses. But instead of actually having no IP address at all, the parent gets a virtual adapter and whatever IP addressing information that was here gets put here. So if my parent or my Hyper-V was 192.168.20.10 on this physical adapter before we made it into Hyper-V, that same IP address information would be here. Okay. And these virtual machines can also be connected to this virtual switch then giving them access to the physical network. And this is how clients on the physical network can access the services here, okay? So for example, again, we've got a Hyper-V with a network interface card, a physical one, and a Wi-Fi card. Forget about a Wi-Fi, don't worry about that. 
most servers don't have Wi-Fi. This is probably obviously a, a a virtual machine that's on a desktop machine. Okay. Then we create a new virtual switch. Okay, this is a PowerShell commandlet. New. So with PowerShell just as a tip, it's always verb. Then now. New is create something new. And now is what are you creating? New virtual switch. We could use uh, we could use the same sort of new uh, combined with AD object, for example, or AD user. So it's, it's, that's the methodology or the logic behind it. The name, that's an uh, option, is called public. Public is similar to our production network where we have external access. The adapter name that we're going to use is Ethernet. So you see how that's called Ethernet? We're basically saying that we're going to connect this virtual switch to this Ethernet adapter as a switch port and allow management OS. So, so basically management OS is that parent partition, okay? Allow management OS equals uh, true means the parent will get a virtual adapter that's connected to this virtual switch. Make any sense? Alexi, all good? All right, so once we do that, you can see that that now becomes a switch port get a virtual Ethernet adapter which is connected to the public. That's the name of this virtual switch. And that effectively is the parent partitions or management OSs, that's a word for it, access to the virtual network. And here's another example, a new virtual switch, switch type. In this case, we're specifying the switch type. If we don't specify, it's basically external. This one's internal and the name is host. And now, because uh, uh, this one gets a new virtual adapter, and uh, basically this, uh, because the internal allows for the parent partition, and this is connected to the host, which is the name of the virtual switch. Here's another one, new virtual switch, switch type private. Name is private. Do we expect a new virtual adapter here? Yes or no? Right. Do we expect, you know how we've been getting, every time we create one, we get this one, we then we get this one. In this command, this one here. Yes. No, your answer is no. Yes. Yours is yes, yours is no. What about you? Probably no. Okay, he says no. What about you, Roman? Yes. No, okay. So, uh, so let, let's explain why not. Um, it's called this private network, so it's uh, only uh, for Yes, yeah. yeah, that's right. So if you remember in our previous page, we said the private one is only for the VMs, the parent doesn't have connection. And there you go. There's no new So it, it, it won't be shown anywhere. No, it's a it's it's a won't be shown on the on the parent partition. Okay. In the virtual machine, you can choose to be on this network. Okay. Okay, so if you go back to my, my impression should be like yeah. at least it should be, yeah. Visible, so. I, I know it's there. It's when you go to management console, you can see it. Okay, it's just that the parent, the key yeah. word is the parent. See this one? Oh, parent yeah. has no connection. Okay, so, okay. so that's that's why I was putting you on a test. Okay, so you had a freeze, not bad. All right, so it's, there's some advanced Hyper V networking features. Here will be actually a little bit faster because it's not, not a huge deal. Most of the time, we don't need it. Basically, ARP, we all know what ARP is, and neighbor discovering poisoning protection. So you probably remember from Cisco, we can have loops. Up. If we had multiple network connections, let's remember we haven't done this recap. Network, uh, NIC1 connected to the physical network. We've got NIC2 connected to the physical network, all for the same virtual switch. Load balancing, uh, what's a tail over? But you can also create switching loops, couldn't you? So basically, because of that, uh, we can uh, we can actually use the uh, discovery poisoning protection. It protects against ARP and neighbor discovery spoofing. Uh, so that protects against that. And then the, we also have DHCP guard, which protects against rogue DHCP servers in the virtual machine. So rogue DHCP is basically if you have a DHCP server as a virtual machine, but you connect it to the uh, physical network, you can start giving IP addresses to the physical network, right? But if that's not what, what it's meant to do, then it's, it's not registered in the Active Directory, 
and it's called the rogue DHCP, and that DHCP guard protects against this DHCP server receiving. Remember the DHCP door? Discover, offer, uh, request, and then acknowledge. Okay, but it, it pre prevents the DHCP guard prevents your virtual machine DHCP server if you obviously turn it on uh, from uh, responding to the DHCP request. There's port ACLs, so we all know where ACLs are, so access control lists, effectively allowing denying traffic on the ports. If you remember, when we spoke in VSphere, we talked about how we can have VLANs. Okay, so obviously if we have VLANs, we need trunk ports. Okay, so our uplink port to the physical switch, the physical switch port that we're connected to must be configured as a trunk port. So trunk mode is a virtual uh, to a virtual machine, Trunk mode forwards traffic from multiple VLANs, and uh, network. Uh, we also can do network um, uh, traffic monitoring, and we can also limit bandwidth and burst support. So, with uh, virtual switch extensibility, so extensibility means you can add additional extensions, additional features. Like it's almost like adding those browser add-ons. Any more functionality to your browser extensions might be cool. So if we have, this is the Hyper-V virtual switch and you've got the physical network adapter, what you can do is we can actually add, uh, it's extensible, which we can add NDIS uh, filter drivers, WFP callout drivers, extensions include ingress, forwarding, e egress and monitoring, and the virtual switch can be replaced. So if we basically we can what this means is that we can actually plug the software to access this virtual switch for a switch and do these kind of fields. We can actually ingress traffic going in, egress traffic going out, and forwarding is like uh, when you are doing the NAT and stuff like that and monitoring. So we can actually plug our software to actually monitor, filter, and and actually inspect what's going on on the virtual switch. That's what it basically means, all of that. It's a lot of words, but that's what it means. There's also SRIOV, so this requires the physical support. So this is a network adapter, it's a physical network adapter. It's either got this feature turned on, or it has this feature, or it doesn't have this feature. But this SRIOV is a, is a feature you can check on your network interface card. It requires the network uh, support in the network adapter. It provides direct memory access to the virtual machines. Uh, DMA, you might have heard that term before. Uh, increases network throughput, reduces network latency, reduces the CPU overhead on the Hyper-V server, and by, uh, the virtual machines bypass the virtual switch. Let's think about what that means. So it means that this virtual, the virtual, uh, sorry, this network interface card, so physical card, is designed for virtualization. So we know that uh, every time your virtual machine needs to do something, it makes a request. The underlying hypervisor um, yeah, was, takes those requests and does something, and then puts on the physical network card and network. Okay, but that something it does requires memory, requires CPU power. And also, it means there's a bit of lag as well. But what this SRIOV does is actually, it's designed for virtualization. So, hey, we'll just give the virtual machines direct access to the memory on the virtual network card, uh, on the network card, and we can bypass all the overheads of the CPU being used on the host. So, this type of uh, thing, this type of network card, uh, supports live migration even when there's different IO, uh, SRIOV adapters. So if we look at it diagrammatically, if a virtual machine with a virtual network card uh, goes through here, gets the uh, physical network card, there's no <coughs> SRIOV. So we have to go through the parent partition. Okay, remember that's the hyper -beat. We have 
with this SRIOV, those virtual machines, after obviously initially you know, using the virtual switch, can then offload those functions directly to the physical hardware. If it offloads to the physical hardware, the parent partition and hence the CPU and hence the memory of the of the physical machine is not used. It reduces lag, improves efficiency, and and basically reduces the load of the host. What is dy dynamic virtual machine queue? Uh, network adapters use queues. Okay, well, hopefully you all know about queues. Queues is a lineup. In the real world, remember when the, we were running out of toilet paper, people were lining up to get the toilet paper. Um, I'm sure like a, a, there's other places where you just line up, you first come, first in the line, right? Then you keep behind that person, behind that person, you get your turn when it's yours, where you go up. So network adapters receive queues to route traffic to appropriate virtual machines. So they have all these requests coming in, requests going out, but they put them in queues. Uh, so physical, again, this is a physical network card must support this VM queue feature. And this dyna dy dynamically uses multiple CPUs when processing the virtual machine traffic and the direct memory access reduces the CPU overhead on the uh, RPV server. So that direct memory access means the virtual machines can access the card directly. Uh, better, beneficial when virtual machines receive a lot of traffic. So VMQ is automatically configured and tuned. It's based on the processor, networking and CPU load. And this VMQ is enabled by default on adapters, on virtual network adapters, but it's only used if the physical adapter supports it. So what does all of this mean? I'm not going to be specifically looking for it in your assignment, definitely not, because this is a little bit higher level than I need to. But if you were designing this as a real project or something, you've got a real job, you've got money paid for you to do, do this, then when you're selecting hardware, I will be looking for the SRIOV and this VMQ feature. I'll be looking for hardware that's designed for virtualization rather than just any old hardware, because you can definitely install any old hardware, it's just it's less efficient. Okay, so when you're building for real, these are things you need to keep in mind, so when you're selecting the hardware. So here are the network adapter features, so advanced features. Some features are available for all virtual network adapters, features that are implemented in the Hyper-V virtual switch. So if we look at this VM1, we have network adapters, okay? In this case, uh, it's a network adapter is not connected to any virtual switch, but we can actually just use this. If we click on this, I know it's just a picture, we can then select the, what networks we connect to, just like in your VMware, uh, sorry, VMware workstation or your vSphere. But when we select the advanced features, we can actually give it a dynamic MAC address means that the MAC address of this virtual machine can change, or we can statically type one in. This is that DHCP guard that we enable for this virtual machine or not. This is the router guard. The router guard, uh, we didn't talk about, but it drops router advertisement and direction messages from unauthorized virtual machines pretending to be routers. And protected uh, network, so this moves this virtual machine to another cluster node if the network connection is detected. It's a bit like our high availability when you have your network isolation. Yeah? Why do we need the dynamic MAC? Uh, dynamic MAC address? Yes. I guess you don't really need it. It's as long as, uh, it's, I think this is where you make clones. If you have dynamic MAC, it just generates a MAC address when okay. it turns on. Okay? With the clones. So basically, uh, that's probably the only reason why you need it. And trust me, I've seen students who know how I copied it or moved it. And we do a assignment, we do a lab where we connect to the bridge network. If they don't choose I copied it, for example, we have all sorts of problems on the on the in the lab. Okay, so this the dynamic uh, MAC addresses of situation. I think the only situation is for duplicate MAC addresses. Okay. If you set it as dynamic, it means that when you boot up, it gets a new MAC address. It doesn't matter the MAC address, unless you have MAC address filtering. 
or are you, unless you do something else like a, a reservation, the HCP reservation. But if you're going to do that, then you might you will have to select static. Okay. So if you're using it, the Mac in any of your other by default option, dynamic. Yeah, default is dynamic. Okay. But if you're using anything like a MAC address for DHCP reservation, MAC address for MAC address filtering, or MAC address for some sort of control or other things, then you choose the static MAC. Okay. All right. So, so again, there's the port mirroring. This port mirroring is interesting. Port mirroring allows. So this this is actually a test question. If we were still having tests, um, port mirroring basically mirrors wherever traffic is going to this virtual machine to another virtual machine or another thing. So port mirroring allows network traffic of a virtual machine to be monitored by copying the incoming and outgoing packets and forwarding copies to another virtual machine, like a monitoring virtual machine. Okay. Uh, well, in this case, it's none, so it's not done. There's NIC teaming. We, we should understand what NIC teaming is. It's just combining multiple network cards to work as one. So NIC teaming provides redundancy and aggregates bandwidth. Same thing. Redundancy is the ability to fail over. Um, so if one fails, no one works. Aggregates means combines. Aggregates. So if you've got two NICs, gigabit each, you NIC team them, you've got two gigabits connection. Uh, can be used at the operating system level, the virtual machine level. Uh, so basically, uh, we know that Microsoft server can do NIC team. So if it's in the operating system level, uh, we that's fine, but it doesn't matter if you get 10 network cards, virtual network cards, at the end of the day, it depends on how you physical connected to the physical environment, doesn't it? So it's not, doesn't make sense to be more at the, uh, at the operating system level, but you can do it at the virtual machine level, uh, which, which means that multiple network adapters in a NIC teaming, if the physical adapter fails, the virtual switch has connectivity. So that's actually now talking about physical network cards in NIC teaming rather than virtual network cards. So virtual network card, virtual NIC teaming, virtual network card NIC teaming is pointless. Um, so we can also have multiple <laughs> virtual network adapters in a NIC team. If a virtual switch fails, the virtual machine has no connectivity anyway. So like I said, the virtual NIC team is pointless almost. Uh, it's particularly important if we have the SROV is used. The SROV traffic bypasses the virtual switch. It's intended to optimize support for teaming. It may be used uh, with any virtual network interface. So it's po pretty much pointless, like I said, unless you've got that. If you've got that, then it makes uh, more efficiency. Um, virtual machines must have multiple network adapters, connect to different virtual switches, and the MAC address spoofing must be enabled. Spoofing means, remember we just said the identical max. Now we say spoofing means identical max. Okay, it's not a duplicate max issue now. It's a deliberate. So what does that mean? It means that uh, both network cards will get the same traffic. All right, let's go and look at this. <laughs> hey, this is interesting. So we can have, so if we have these three colors, red, green, and blue, they're different VLANs. Okay, we've got physical switches in the physical world, Cisco, wherever, but they all should know about virtual uh, VLANs, okay? On the, oh, these are Hyper-V uh, physical machines, and these are virtual machines. So we can have a virtual machine, which is on green VLAN, we can have a virtual machine on red VLAN, and we can have a virtual machine on blue VLAN, and as long as these ports are configured as trunking, and our virtual machines, our virtual net, virtual switches are configured for VLANs, then it can actually pass those VLAN information to the physical environment so that, the, in this case, blue and red can go to their specific physical VLANs as well. So multiple isolated networks on the same infrastructure, VLANs are often used. You can have up to 4,094 VLANs. VLANs cannot spare multiple subnets. It's, it's, it's challenging to, to reconfigure when adding or moving virtual machines. Okay. So what if we add another virtual machine there? Then we have to basically 
make sure that all these ports are configured, trunking, and then what if we add there? Okay, we add more configurations if we, have, we might have to. What if you have multi-tenanted network? So if you think of it, what does multi-tenant Tenant is someone who rents, rents a house or rents a flat or rents space on your server. Okay, AWS, for example, Azure, for example, is what you call multi tenanted They've got a data centers. They have in the cloud, obviously, they call cloud, but really the data centers with virtualization infrastructure and then you have virtual machines on there. They're multi tenanted Speak of your block of flats. If you own a block of flats, a Roman, you'd be very rich. But if you have 20 people renting 20 different flats, that's like your multi tenanted right? But the thing is, if it's multi-tenanted, do you think one tenant should be able to interact with other tenants in your virtual networks? Is that a good thing or bad thing? It depends. <laughs> the, the answer is no, it should not. Okay, because by the following, should, they should have no interaction. All their information, all their data should be okay. okay, for security reasons. So Private VLANs address some of the VLAN scalability issues, it reduces the number of IP subnets and VLANs. Virtual switches can limit virtual machines to the same VLANs. We can also use port ACLs, access controlled uh, lists, but this is challenging to uh, manage and update. Hyper-V virtual switch support supports VLANs and uh, port ACLs, but the real solution, and this is how AWS Azure and all those cloud providers actually do it. They do what's called software defined networking, SDN. Okay, have you heard of that before? Maybe you have. What about you guys? Have you been taught that in uh, your Azure subject and so forth? No, probably you don't need to because they don't look at the hardware side of it. They just look at the really the your your use of it. Like you're the you're the customer. But if I was building my own idea of AWS, this is that's what we the subject's all about. This is provide uh, building your own private cloud. But I can also turn that private cloud into public cloud if I have if I want to start Alex's cloud services, for example. Okay. Is it AWS Alex Computer Research Room? Yeah, yeah. Well, why not? Yeah, I've got money. I can I can make as big as your now. I can't. <laughs> That's uh, probably the, uh, but there's a lot, a lot of other cloud providers besides AWS and Azure. Okay, there's uh, many others, in fact. But underneath the customer, okay, the tenants, we use SDN or software defined networking so that each customer is isolated from each other. Okay, let's actually try to understand what it means. Okay, the network, the solution is SDN or software defined networking. Network virtualization is independent to the hardware. Uh, it, sorry, in the implemented network virtualization is an impl implementation of software defined networking. Uh, Hyper-V enables network virtualization. So if we look at this, we've got two tenants, red and blue. Uh, if we, okay, doesn't matter, red company, blue company, and this is our, they can both sit on our physical service. Okay, so that's what AWS Azure infrastructure looks like is that you have different companies all sitting on the same hardware, right? And obviously that hardware extends to physical network. But you got blue network and you got a red network. So they might have virtual networking for their, I'm sure you've heard it in AWS, you've got the virtual private cloud, VPC, and so forth. With the server virtualization, multiple virtual machines run on the same server. Each virtual machine is isolated from others. That's what we need to do. With the network virtualization, multiple virtual networks run on the same physical network. Each network needs to be isolated from each other. Okay, that's what you expect. That's what these customers expect. So how do we do it? So benefits of this uh, software defined networking is that it's flexible virtual machine placement. Okay, you can put it on any piece of hardware, any infrastructure, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a uh, multi tenanted network isolation without VLANs, so there's no VLANs being used. Oh, it's 
which there's no VLANs being used, how do they use the same physical network and not have their traffic interacting with each other or not being or IP address reuse, which mean, what does that mean? That means that the blue network and the red network could use the same network ID. So they're using the same infrastructure with the same IP. Yeah, they can use whatever IP address because it's got no relationship with, with the physical infrastructure. That's what we'll say next, okay? Live migrate, we can live and migrate across multiple subnets. Well, what does that mean? Remember when we live migrate, we still have a static IP address for that server, right? How does it go to a different subnet and still work if that IP address is from the old subnet? Okay? In the physical world, that blows your mind, doesn't it? How can that work? So this is one of the hardest things to sort of visualize because all our understanding is how can we move an IP address, a computer from this network with this IP address from this subnet, subnet move it to other subnet, it's live migration, isn't it? It's not like we have to go in and we change the IP address. Nothing changes. It's transparent, moving our virtual machines to a shared infrastructure as a service cloud. So this basically is a prelude to going to the cloud, private cloud, to the uh, to the actual uh, to the public cloud. And basically, if we implement the software defined networking, we can move the virtual machines from the private cloud to the to the uh, public cloud without reconfiguring the IP addresses. Well, how does that work? It can be configured using PowerShell. It, you, it can also be configured using the System Center uh, Virtual Machine Manager. So it's not something that default in VMware. I'm not sorry, Hyper-V. Can't do it with Hyper-V um, Hyper Manager, the normal one. You can only do it in a software, uh, and also System Center, EMM. Virtual Machine Manager, or you have to use PowerShell. So let's have a look at what, what it means then, okay? So we, our physical infrastructure is 192.168.2.22 is our physical server. This one's 5.55, so they're on different subnets. Okay, Blue customer has a virtual machine which is 10.1.1.11. Red customer has a, <laughs> I guess a virtual machine which is 10.1.1.11, so it's the same IP address. And this is another server from red and blue. They're on a different physical network and they've got this IP address. Same again. The customer address space is based on virtual machine configuration. The provider address is based on the physical network. So as a provider, that's us, the physical people, we can build a physical infrastructure based on whatever networking IP address we want. That's fine. Easy enough to understand, but then these virtual machines have their own addresses space. So this physical uh, physical network is not visible to the virtual machines, so they can't actually interact with the physical network based on IP addressing. So what happens then? So this is all good and fine, but what happens? You probably heard of the term encapsulation, right? Basically, what's happening is there's actual like there's an extra layer of encapsulation and you get this GRE key, okay? GRE key, you can see it's 5,000 and one, okay? So basically, if we had this, uh, it's, it's blue, I think, yeah, it's blue. So this blue network is defined as that. It's gonna wrap the communication up with an extra layer of encapsulation and then it encapsulates it with the physical address of the, physical machine and the physical destination of the physical machine. And then it has the GIE code and it's got the MAC address and it's got, then this is all encapsulated inside. So it's extra envelope. Remember when I teach my Cisco people, I teach the fact that you've got an letter, you put it in an envelope, you put another envelope, you put another envelope, you put another envelope, then that's encapsulation. And as you get to each step, you unwrap the envelope, you look at it, then you see what's inside of it and decide what to do. Okay, we're all familiar with that idea. So, what about the red? The red does the same thing. But you notice the key, GIE key is different. That's the difference, isn't it? Everything is, else is identical. IP address, source, destination, physical, is the same. 
But the only difference is that GRE key is different. And that's the software part of it. Okay? That part turns our virtual machines of our clients and separates them. But they're still sharing the exact same physical infrastructure. And it, the key, key thing is it doesn't even matter. If I move this virtual machine here, it still can keep its IP address. Can't, can't it? And it's, the, the encapsulation just takes it over the rest. But the key thing is this key is different. So when it, when it travels through the physical infrastructure, gets to this server, it reads that key. It's 5,000, 5, goes to this one. 6,001, goes to this one. That's the extra layer. That's the software defined layer of the network. Now, it makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? If we have this extra layer of encapsulation, it doesn't matter if they're sitting on this hardware, that hardware, this subnet or that subnet, because they encapsulate it with whatever physical environment they find themselves in. Understanding? Alexi, you look like you're trying to... I have two questions. Yep, yeah, that's right. So basically we have a GRE key instead of a VLAN tag in here. Yeah, so no VLANs at all. Okay. Yeah, but... But it's similar, you know. We oh, have just extra yeah. extra information in the packet. Yeah, yeah, extra information. But the key thing is, I don't have to configure any of this physical world switches. Okay. But we have to do some settings on the on the uh, on virtual the, machines. Yeah, on the on the so the the uh, so not virtual machine on the hardware. Okay. On the hardware only. So the hard to be. How? Okay. Yeah. So the virtual machines, they're, they're just normal virtual machines. The only settings we configure are on the hard to be. Okay, so okay. Hacker V knows whether yeah. it's in the blue uh, yeah, or, VLAN yeah. or red or red. VLAN. Yeah, so basically the Hyper V encapsulates this. Okay? Okay. So the Hyper V, so this one, this, this thing here is created by the Hyper V, it encapsulates this, puts whatever physical details are on, on, so, on, on, the, on, the, on the packet, sends it through the physical world, the physical routers, the physical switches, do you know, just treat it like normal thing. When it gets to the destination Hyper V, Again, the Hyper-V is configured to recognize that there's this extra layer. It unwraps the packet, looks at that GRE key, and then puts it on the right virtual network. You get me? So yeah. the Hyper-V is doing all the work. It's a simple configuration in the Hyper-V. All your, all your physical devices, like router switches, they just behave like normal. No VLAN is required to be configured to get this achieve this. So, Okay. Yeah. So if we are talking about one, uh, one Hyper-V, yeah, and with the two uh, virtual machines with the same address, yeah. So it's similar to uh, access port for particular VLAN. Yeah. So when we create a uh, virtual machine, we we're saying it's in the blue team or it's in the red team. Yeah. Correct. So I suppose it's pretty similar to VLAN. Oh, you can VLAN try if, you, if it helps you understand it. Yeah, definitely. But, yeah, this, but is all, just, this is all done in software on the Hyper-V. That's key difference, okay? Yeah. All right, it does not need to be reconfigured the physical network infrastructure. Okay, and also that means that I can take these virtual machines, don't need to change any details of it and put it on a totally different network, physical network infrastructure, and it'll still work. You see that? So these, I can take this virtual machine yeah. from, uh, from Elizabeth, yeah. And I can put it on Adelaide site, and, uh, and, 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 and all of this physical details would change because obviously different subnet, but the virtual machines will still work. Okay, and any traffic that's going to uh, this from the client, the virtual physical network infrastructure will get it to this Hyper-V physical address then it puts it onto the blue team or red team, whatever. Okay. Okay. Then I have another question. Yeah. For example, uh, in Elizabeth's site, we, we also have a blue virtual machine with the same address. And we are moving one from uh, Adelaide's side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The so we have like two machines so in the blue team with yeah. the same address. What's so, happened? So basically, so no, no, this one is ah, 12. It's 12. Okay. This one's 11. This yeah. is just communication between the two. Blue yeah. One. So yes, you can't have two in the blue team with the same IP address, no. That's still, because they're in the same, if you like, net, software defined network. Okay. All the rules about IP addressing and stuff still works, but within the software defined network. You get me? 
And can we have uh, with the same address in the same team on different Hyperion? So, uh, so, so what do you mean, like this one? Yeah, you can, if it's 11, 11, also 11. What yeah, yeah, so this one I can move here. Sorry, this. Uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, on first Hyper-V, yeah, 111. Yeah, and can we have on the second one 111 in the blue team as well? Uh, no. So, so, so it's, oh, okay. So if this was okay, let's say this does not exist, okay? Yeah. And this was 12. Is that what you're saying? No, no. I'm saying if we have Hyper-V, yeah, and 111 client, yeah, we have second. Okay, yeah. Can we have also blue client uh, 111? No, uh, no, no, because no. again, they're, they're part of the same network. Okay. So yeah, yeah, they have to still so, obey the rules of IP address yeah. within that software department. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So basically, if we give you a scenario, we've got the blue yonder airlines and the Woodgrove Bank, and that's instead of you know blue red t uh, company, these are two different companies. They both have web and SQL server, which is your normal, pretty common combination of uh, for web web uh, applications and basically we've got these uh, we've got these uh, policies which has uh, which is the host is 10 and these are things these are the policy settings uh, again provider address customer address and obviously the customer address can be reused you can see it's identical but the provider address is what's in the physical infrastructure and basically we can define the address providers address mapping, specify the, uh, on which Hyper-V the virtual machines are running. The Hyper-V implements the policy by translating incoming and outgoing packets to the, from the physical to the software defined network. Uh, if a virtual machine is moved, the policies are modified, virtual machine configuration stays the same. So, that's, having said that, are we going to do any of that in our labs? No. Okay. But it's good to know because obviously now it makes the picture a little bit clearer. How does the cloud providers keep people separate? How can they have so literally thousands and hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of customers and all have different okay, uh, virtual networks? How do they provide redundancy by moving your, replicating your your virtual machines from one data center to another data center to another availability zone. How can they keep on working? Remember, so you, you guys done the, uh, AWS? You guys did AWS? No, in the circle? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So remember, we had the different availability zones. We had the EC2 instance. The EC2 instance has a static IP address. How do we move it from one availability zone to another availability zone where you do replication? And have it work it's because of this software defined network. We don't have to reconfigure the virtual machines, we don't have to reconfigure the physical environment, we just move them. Okay? And the software defined network is a very powerful thing for allowing all those things to happen.